And when he runs up to him, he's like, oh, I'm hanging out here because, like, I heard there was a once a great bard who, like, studied in the spot. And I had to screenshot ah. that and send it to Noir and be like, look, they, like, they know they didn't put Cass in this game. <laughs> were, you, were you hiding him? <laughs> oh, Numa, me. tell me. <laughs> Give um, him back. I would love he's up to on be... the highest sky island just oh, fucking <laughs> chilling. <laughs> you just hear, be, imagine, though, like, you're, oh. you're going up and very faintly as you're starting to ascend, accordion. you hear yes, the beginning yes. of that sweet, sweet accordion music. Please. And then... <laughs> Come on. Add, add the, add, okay, so fourth layer of sky islands and Cass is at the top. <laughs> and he's just like, oh, we meet again, traveler. Say, have I told you how much you look like the hero lately? <laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome to a special bonus episode of the Overly Sarcastic Podcast. I am Blue, and I'm joined by Red. Hello! And very special guest, Res Butte, and thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Uh, I, we're so jazzed to have you today. Yeah! Hey, thank you. Yeah, thanks for the invite. Uh, always, always excited to talk about games, and especially uh, the game we're going to talk about. I, yes. I'm sure it's in the title, so I don't know why I'm like, oh, what are, no, we, what are, like, oh, what are games going to be? Is this a Metal Gear Solid special podcast? No. Oh, we're, can we we're here that to talk though, actually? Uh, exclusively and in so much depth about uh, The Legend of Zelda and uh, our really favorite rad. games. And then, of course, Tears of the Kingdom. We gotta uh, to celebrate the launch of the new game. Um, this is a game we've been talking about for a long time. We've been doing live streams about it. Raz, you've got a handful of videos that either directly about Zelda or mm -hmm. reference it uh, in, in the context of broader conversation. So for those of us in the audience uh, who are not familiar with your work, could you briefly introduce yourself? Oh yeah, I mostly make video essays. Uh, if, if you've heard of me, it's probably from a series called Gaming for a Non-Gamer, mm -hmm. where I have my wife, uh, who, who I, in the first episode, made the mistake of calling the lady I live with as like a joke because the original script had my wife like 50 times. And I like, I, I was like, I don't want to be my too wife. Borat. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. I was like, I, I don't want to get that. So then I like changed it out with lady I live with and uh, uh, a lot of people made fun of me for it. So then I just, you know, leaned into it uh, and, and <laughs> haven't stopped using it. Uh, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> My roommate. <laughs> yeah, my Historians roommate. say we were yeah. very good friends. Yeah. <laughs> and now I have a kid and it's like a, this child uh, <laughs> who lives with me. Uh, but yeah, it, it, so it started with, uh, or that's, that's kind of how the channel really took off is, is having her who grew up never playing games um, try out a few and see kind of what what like what things do games just assume you'll know? Because there's a lot of that, that there's like a language to video games yeah. that Anyone who's played them for a year, two years, uh, me and my whole life, you know, just knows, you know, like to figure out what button it is to jump. But but for someone who who hasn't played games, uh, that's all that's all stuff that the game or someone else needs to teach them. So it, it, it was kind of a fun exploration of how she engaged with trying certain games for the first time. And I think a lot of people connected with it because everyone either knows someone who doesn't play a lot of games and has tried them and is like, I, I don't understand this, or they are that person. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's nice to to be seen in that way. So yeah, that's that's kind of the big series I have, but you know, then I'll just, anything I like, uh, yeah. <laughs> I will make a video about, uh, yeah. and that's about it. Yeah, we were talking earlier before we started recording, your episode on the, the sound of loneliness in games is a really, really good one. Uh, of course, yeah, the uh, Gaming for a Non-Gamer is always fun to see. Uh, the Elden Ring one, I enjoyed a real full <laughs> circle moment of beating the, uh, the, the, the boss in the, the first Dark Souls game. Yeah, but, yeah. yeah. It, it, it's been interesting to continue the series uh, as time has gone on of like, you know, she's played a bunch of games now, so it's not the exact same reaction of like, knowing nothing so it's been fun to kind of explore the journey and how far she's come at this point so yeah, yeah. Uh, that one was a fun one very cool the, stuff um, the thing about how if you haven't played games before you don't kind of have muscle memory that the game assumes you have uh i actually had an interesting experience with that um so the 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 conceit of this first part of the episode is we're each going to talk about our favorite uh, Zelda games, and I don't want to immediately hijack and be like, me first, but no, go <laughs> such on, a queen. good transition. <laughs> um, because uh, the first Zelda game that I like got and played just because I was so interested in it was Twilight Princess, uh, and I had basically very little experience playing any sort of game like that before. I'd played things like... Um, 
Smash Bros and like Wii Sports Resort, and that was kind of it. Uh, so there were a number of points in that game where I was like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I'm having a good time, but like, like the final boss fight, there's a round of Energy Ball Tennis with a possessed Zelda, mm-hmm. uh, and I just didn't know what that was. So she was throwing these energy balls at me, and I was dodging them, and I was like, I feel like this has gone on for too long. Like there's something I should <laughs> mm-hmm. be doing, and I smacked it back at her, and I was like, Oh, I'm a genius! And then she smacked it back at me and just obliterated <laughs> like, me, and I was like, That's Oh, illegal. whoops! <laughs> so, well, yeah, you think about the lineage of that like that happens in Link to the Past mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. Ocarina of Time and when so you know for me it's like oh here comes here comes the tennis portion of yeah, Zelda here's <laughs> the energy ball of tennis but I just didn't know so Link and I were learning that together <laughs> just yeah. like I got it so um, yeah. But yeah, uh, it's a it's a really fun game. I liked it. I was lured in because I was told that this was the edgy one with a pretty Link, and I was like, "Yeah, <laughs> listens I'll, to Lincoln sure. Park." Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so I, I I played it, and I had such a good time with it. It was really fun. Uh, the version I was playing, the mini map was broken for various reasons. It was definitely played on a legitimate console and uh, not any uh, other sure. thing that yeah. you could play a game on. Uh, but uh, it was kind of fun navigating without the mini map and uh, just sort of figuring stuff out on the go. Uh, I like that the plot is Cowboy Werewolf versus Alien Invasion. I think that's really fun and spicy, and I think more Zelda games should do that sort of thing. Um, Yeah, man, I don't know. It was probably one of the first Zelda games where I really liked the aesthetic and the art design for it. Mm -hmm. Um, And while a lot of games in the Zelda franchise have kind of deviated from that linearity and especially the the edginess that it kind of got made fun of for at the time, I think that art direction is something that they've actually kind of stuck with. Um, Like a lot of very... Let's make everybody a really pretty elf person instead of a little bobblehead. It's like eight pixels high, uh, mm-hmm. you know that kind of thing. Uh, and the the designs of the Twilight has a lot in common with the designs they've been using. There's enough in common with the designs of the Zonai that people yeah. are like, "Hey, wait a second, <laughs> what happened to those other Zonai?" Actually, though, <laughs> so. Yeah. Uh, I- I uh, it's just graphically, I love the way the lighting looks in mm. in Twilight Princess. I mean, like crossing the bridge of Hylia and the opening cutscene is just like, whoa, but it's also golden the, uh, hour of the game. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I I really respect Twilight Princess's commitments to just smack the player with every conceivable major phobia. Where it's like, are you afraid of big things underwater? <laughs> Fuck you. Are you afraid of spiders? <laughs> Fuck you. Are you afraid of alien invasions? Fuck you. Are you afraid of creepy haunted houses? Okay, well, this one's not the creepiest, but, like, also still fuck you. <laughs> you ready for this lady to get possessed and her head snaps around? Have yeah. fun. Oh, my God. <laughs> but also, Telepathic it's like... Telepathic neck snapping, yeah. But it's so weird also, because everyone's like, this is the dark game. This is the edgy game. And it's like, mm-hmm. canonically, the people of Hyrule in this game were created by little chicken people. <laughs> L- little chicken people with big cannons. Those were... Like, every Zelda game is like there were people from the sky and they were great and powerful and cool and stuff and in this one it's like chicken you find her baby and it's just a little orb <laughs> some spore character creator ass abominations up in the sky <laughs> yeah i think that was like even at the time i was like this is weird right <laughs> like why is she designed like that but you know yeah. it's it's so fun and the thing with the twilight is really interesting and midna is an absolute delight like it turns yeah. out the the best way to make the support character that gives you tips and tricks and stuff like not annoying was to make her intentionally and self-aware annoying like <laughs> mm-hmm. like like, Navi doing it is frustrating. Fee doing it is frustrating. But Midna, it's like, oh, you're such a bitch and I love it. <laughs> well, and so. it plays into the story really well of just, mm-hmm. like, her growth as a character. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, I, they hadn't really done that before with a huge character arc for the companion. No. Uh, Navi didn't have one. Tattle in Majora's Mask sort of has one, but it's pretty quick. Mm-hmm. Uh, and not explored super deep. And Yeah, then... I guess Tetra. I, I, does Tetra even count as a companion? Not really. I well, guess it's more King of Red arc, Lions. But yeah. yeah, yeah. But but yeah, it's a it's a big one of like, hey, we have this thing that has been a part of the Zelda 3D Zelda series for a while. Let's do something with it. Yeah. <laughs> Finally, yeah. yeah. Twilight Princess is fun because it really feels like Link doesn't want to be there and shouldn't have to be there. This is so thoroughly not about him. He just mm-hmm. gets caught in the crossfire and turns out to be the bearer of the Triforce of Courage. And then it's like, whoopsies, instead of getting turned into a shade, you get turned into this sick-ass wolf. And now you get to help these two star-crossed princesses get their acts together. Yeah. And like, mm-hmm. it's just... We, like, we've talked about this on stream and stuff, but it's it's really funny that in, in this continuity, 
Zelda, like, absolutely has it locked down. She knows exactly what's going on. She's aware of, like, the whole, like, cosmic thing. It's like, mm -hmm, okay, mm -hmm. you're a, a dumb farm boy, but, like, look, here's the deal. I'm gonna go get, like, <laughs> captured or whatever, but, like, you need to... And Link is like, ah! Well, she's legitimately like, hey, I'm really sorry. I kind of screwed this one up. Like, it wasn't supposed to be like this. It's kind of rough that you're already stuck as a wolf. <laughs> like, also, this is one of the Links with the most visual personality, which is pretty cool because he physically can't talk for, like, 50% of the game when he is a wolf and then when he turns into a person he's just like why would I talk now it's, it's <laughs> mm -hmm. whatever I just think it's a lot of fun and the character dynamics are cool I definitely mixed missed like all of the Zelda and Midna subtext the first time I played it I was just like cool they know each other all right and then like mm -hmm. two years later I was like hey wait a second um but it's just so fun. I was also very sad that Midna was like, oh, I'll see you again soon unless I do this, and then breaks the mirror. And I was like, no, oh, come back. Yeah. <laughs> Please bring the Twilight back in later games. They're so cool. Yeah, there's just a vibe to Twilight Princess that is is probably, it's the only game that has it. The music, mm -hmm. the atmosphere is yeah. just is just so wonderful. Yeah. yeah, steeped in the embers of Twilight. It's just so fun. So <laughs> that's yeah, that's that, my that's, that's me really banging great. on the drum of Twilight Princess good actually again. But uh, <laughs> what about you? I guys? don't think you need the actually. It's just Twilight Princess good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I feel like the actually implies that it's a hot take and that you're gonna get the pushback. Um, <laughs> Maybe in like 2000. 12 when people were like, oh, edgy Zelda, yeah, <laughs> whatever. Uh, huh. For for me, though, my um, my Zelda experience was I, I got to the game pretty late. The first one that I ever played was Twilight Princess on Wii, but I got stuck the first time I was Wolf Link and I didn't know where to go, so I was just like, <laughs> I guess I'm done. Uh, <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> and then bad I came ending. Back, yeah, uh, and then I came back uh, for Breath of the Wild and I had my first experience with the game. And we'll talk about that a little later. And I was like, oh, this rules. And then I'm like, okay, now I'm a Zelda kid now, <laughs> a million years too late. But uh, the earliest Zelda game that I've played was when they did the Link's Awakening remake for Switch with a little, mm -hmm. little diorama doll style game. Uh, and that's probably my favorite of the series, um, not having played any of the other 2D ones before. I came into this with absolutely no prior knowledge, no expectations whatsoever, no thoughts head empty. And it just felt so fun to explore this this tiny little world, figuring out, oh, the awakening wasn't what happened at the beginning of the game. That's what's going to happen at the end. Oh, no. Oh, no. Um, and, and going through all the fun little dungeons and, like, the really fantastic dungeon design in Link's Awakening was, was mm -hmm. what caught me by surprise. Because I'd done the Divine Beast, and it's like, oh, yeah, no, I like this. And then I did Link's Awakening, I'm like, oh, Oh, okay. I, I see what people are on about now. Yeah. Um, and the the idea that in order to go and save Hyrule and not drown at sea, you have to sacrifice Koholan Island is just, oh God, it's so, it's so beautifully tragic. Um, and I, I really liked the, uh, the, the way that the ending plays out, just the Ballad of the Windfish having to mm -hmm. actually go through that at the very end is, is mm -hmm. a very very affecting experience and seeing the whole island just fade to white until eventually Link, real Link with actual proportions, uh, wakes back <laughs> up at the end of the game. Oh, um, I, I really enjoyed That's it funny. a lot. Uh, there's yeah. a donkey video where he talks about uh, the game and the the weird dreamlike logic where it, it, it really does feel like you're in a dream when you acknowledge, oh, like none of this shit makes sense whatsoever. <laughs> uh, even like with regular, you know, Zelda logic and, and video game stuff. It's like there's so much stuff that's just completely weird. And since they were playing around in a dream, it's like, yeah, we can bring in Kirby and Chain Chomps and stuff. Like, why not? It's fine. It's it, it makes Half sense. It's dream logic. Of his crossovers and Smash Bros. Yeah, and once you invest yourself in that, a lot of stuff just kind of fits together and, and makes sense and, and flows very nicely. So I if I uh, uh, if I'd played this game more recently, I'd have more more articulate thoughts on it. But that's uh. That's essentially uh, it for me. I feel like I, having played it, recognized like, oh, I understand why people who grew up with this games have such a strong connection to them. Because like, if, mm. if I grew up with this, I would never shut up about it. Like, oh my <laughs> god, I'd be hopeless. And being able to go back and and play it uh, on the modern hardware, Nintendo Switch Online, notwithstanding, because it doesn't count, <laughs> um, was was really really cool. And uh, it it it's nice that. 
that game got remade and i hope they do it for a bunch of the other ones because it's like you know yes. trying to convince yeah. a kid to watch a black and white movie it's like but it's good i promise like but where's the colors well i think that's <laughs> one really interesting part about it and i'm sure you know someone listening to this can correct me if i'm wrong on it but well, I, i'm worry, pretty sure <laughs> <laughs> the Link's awakening remake from what i remember it is very faithful to the original it's oh, yeah. mostly just a new coat of paint yep. um which yeah, which I think works really well for it. And it also shows, like, how good of a game the original Link's Awakening that uh, I think it was, I think it came out after A Link to the Past. So it was, like, the fourth Zelda game. Yeah. Uh, and it's just so good still. Uh, it, 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 like, the dungeons are great. The story is quite good for, uh, you know, a, 90, a 93 oh Game Boy yeah. game. <laughs> um, you know, and, and yeah, for to work for a modern audience, they just needed to bring it to the switch and yeah. make it a little more colorful <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah it it, it it has held up incredibly well uh and yeah just a beautiful I, game i feel like it's it's a common sentiment when a, a, a really strong remaster or remake comes out and people say like oh my gosh like this is how i remember it looking but what i saw mm-hmm. around link's awakening was this is what the game looked like when I was thinking about it in my head and I wasn't mm-hmm. playing. Because people said, like, when I was playing this game, I had no idea what the fuck I was fighting on screen. These monsters, like, I, I couldn't tell what they were. <laughs> it's yeah. like, oh, these are little Octoroks or little, like, you know, jelly monster guys or, or whatever. But the way that they, they took this game and didn't even need to touch the fundamental design. Good design. Good game design is good mm-hmm. game design. Good, it's, there it's, it is. <laughs> it's amazing that the, the craft still comes through all these years later probably because of games like this having such a strong influence on the lineage of design and Zelda games in particular yeah. and just, you know, 2D games uh, like that. And uh, I hesitate to call it a Metroidvania. That sounds almost <laughs> heretical. But, like, games of that ilk uh, yeah. <laughs> in general. There's, there was this interesting uh, thing that I've been seeing for the last, like, decade or two where you start getting these remakes that are designed to be, like, how the original made me feel when I watched it when I was mm-hmm. six. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's kind of how I feel Breath of the Wild and then Tears of the Kingdom were trying to be. It's like these games were about the wonders of exploring caves and, and striking out into this big world with nothing but the sword on your back and a dream. And then, like, you know, the original, like, little 8-bit ones, it's like, well, I can imagine that this is cool. But, you know, but, but like, when you're immersed in it, when you're playing it, it feels cool, even if it doesn't look that way. Yeah. So with, when they do these new things with the remasters, like um, how in Breath of the Wild, the designs of the Guardians were like, when you're playing that first Zelda, those Octoroks are huge. So, yeah. like, there are Octoroks in Breath of the Wild, but the real spiritual successor to them is the Guardians. They look the part. They are that huge. Yeah. They're scary. Um, and I really like that. I think it's it's probably the best way to do sequels and remakes and reboots is like, this is how this made me feel. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, there are obviously the direct, you know, Zelda sequels out there, but it is really neat to see with like Twilight Princess to Ocarina of Time uh, and then Breath of the Wild to Zelda 1 when you like not doing the Link's Awakening thing where you're not just trying to like remake the game on modern hardware and make it look beautiful, but it's like, what was the fundamental idea of this game and what can we do with that now when we start from this first principle so uh with with my link's awakening uh portion of the show done uh raz please tell us about uh breath of the wild and why you like it so much yeah yeah so it's so hard picking a favorite zelda game uh i love i've I've played every Zelda game, uh, every every mainline Zelda game. Uh, no no wands of Gamelon. <laughs> I, I've done Link's Crossbow training. Oh, is it good. fun? Uh, it's, you know, okay. it's a gimmick. <laughs> uh, and yeah, I think Breath of the Wild came out at a very interesting time for the gaming landscape and just for me as a fan of video games and Zelda. Uh, I like Skyward Sword a fair bit. I think it's a solid game. But, but certainly when you look at Skyward Sword and the extreme linearity of it um, and, and how it felt like the series wasn't necessarily doing a ton of new stuff, um, you know, there was a good portion of time where I was like, I, I want something more um, from Zelda than this. Like, I, this is fun, but I, I need it to elevate. I need yeah. something new. And then Breath of the Wild was announced as an open world game. And I was like, oh my gosh, no, <laughs> no, this is a terrible idea. Yeah, we were uh, all terrified. I, uh, yeah. every, everything, was, well, exactly. everything was trying to be Skyrim and we were mm-hmm. like, no. Yeah. yeah. So going into Breath of the Wild at that point, I was pretty low on Zelda. I was kind of like, 
I, I have you know Skyward Sword was fine, but I didn't I didn't love it love it. So I was kind of low on Zelda and on their direction, and I was super low on open world games because uh, I hadn't really played one for years that I found engaging or that like did a good job of being an open world game. Yeah, uh, most of them just felt like they could have been a very linear game, but then. Hey, why not add a bunch of towers? Uh, <laughs> Long-suffering Assassin's <laughs> Creed fan exactly. here. <laughs> exactly. Uh, they just didn't utilize open worlds very well. Uh, so I was very... I almost didn't get Breath of the Wild uh, because of that. But then on a whim, I, I bought a Switch. I bought Breath of the Wild. And it was the most like magical gaming experience I've ever had. It was just a week of... So cool. of stumbling across things uh, that felt so organic. Every moment kind of felt like it was my own. Yeah. Um, even though they're not, you know, <laughs> a lot of them are intentionally designed for you to approach them in a certain way. But because because you can climb a mountain from any angle, mm -hmm. it always feels like it's your way. And it's just all these small touches and, and the non-linearity of the game, even though, you know, I did all the main dungeons and I did them probably in the order they want you to. Probably. Um, yeah. But I felt like I had control, you know. Yeah. It's it's that What's illusion. Zora because first, Goron last. Is that the order most people? They do really it? suggest that you do Mifa's Grace first. There are Zora mm -hmm. everywhere in that yeah. starting part of the map, and they're like, "Hey, hey, you should go talk to our boss. He's right <laughs> over there." Yeah. So if you're just following, you know, your whims, it's like, I guess I'll go talk to the boss. Hot fishman seeking Hylian twink. <laughs> <laughs> Hot fishman in your area. <laughs> it is interesting you say Goron last because I did Gerudo. Gerudo last, last. Yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. I think that yeah. Goron last, like you can do Goron last, but it's close-ish to Zora's domain, mm -hmm. so it's yeah, not too wild for you to go there next and just have to get the armor and the fireproof elixirs and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, the armor was the stumbling block for me because it was expensive. Yeah. <laughs> and that's I did Gerudo funny... last in Tears of the Kingdom. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. I did Goron last in Tears of the Kingdom. Ah, okay. <laughs> I also did Gerudo. I did What's Gerudo it like last to be on the wrong Kingdom? side of history, <laughs> exactly. right? <laughs> well, I mean, I guess that's the interesting part, is I'm like, hey, there seems like there's uh, a set order that you're supposed to do the Divine Beast in Breath of the Wild. Uh, but someone else is like, oh, I see it as a different order, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that's a beautiful thing. Um, I, yeah, I think there are a million issues with Breath of the Wild. Uh, I, I've talked about <laughs> them. Yeah. Um, but it's like, if this, if a game can give you an experience that pretty much no other game can, you're willing to to deal with that stuff yeah. <laughs> and ignore it. It's easy to because of just that sense of freedom and discovery, um, and and just like sense of place, uh, yeah. which is a big thing I think in Breath of the Wild. Mm. The sound design is incredible. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I I've heard a lot of people talk about it before, but just like the sound of the wind in that game, yeah, just it, it's some of the best sounding wind. Yeah, it's funny. Um, I like I'll sometimes hear YouTubers like using the ambience from Breath of the Wild mm -hmm. in, as the background noise, and I'm like, why do I suddenly feel like I need to put on my warm doublet? <laughs> oh shit! <laughs> <laughs> exactly, it just trains yeah. your brain. Like there's mm -hmm. that specific cold sound. Like what yes. does that mean? But you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, and the the thing about like Breath of the Wild being such a a good experience, uh, it, like a, an open world game that feels good to play is very interesting because uh, I got into Breath of the Wild late. It was like out and popular for like three years before I even considered getting it and playing it for myself. Uh, and I kind of regret that because that meant I knew everything that was going to happen in the game when I started playing it. Uh, and I kind of like that's part of the reason why when Tears of the Kingdom came out, I rushed through it as fast as possible because I mm -hmm. wanted to be able to get all those those moments without having them spoiled for me. So I would actually just get to experience them from the ground up without knowing exactly how the ending was going to play out or, or knowing what was coming. And it was so good. It was incredibly stressful. I was yeah. like losing sleep for two and a half weeks about it, but it worked. I got to the end and I was like, I, I need to fucking take a minute and just like <laughs> stare at this wall and just yeah. process all the shit I just went through. Um, yeah. And I, I didn't get that with Breath of the Wild, uh, but I had so much fun with it anyway. Like. I was mentally comparing it to Skyrim, a game that I play uh, by picking a direction and just running and hoping I run into something interesting. And with Breath mm -hmm. of the Wild, that's immediately rewarding because you will run into something mm -hmm. interesting. So, well, it's this yeah. uh, constant loop of small little tasks that some of them take a minute, some of them take five minutes, and it's just stringing these things together instead of being a, a big, massive thing. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, which which works really well. I also love that I can play without the HUD and feel like I'm oh, not yeah. lost. Oh, I got to do that. I got to yeah. try that for Tears of the no, Kingdom. That's the experience. I feel like that would be bananas. But um, 
But yeah, uh, I think yeah. we've about covered our, our personal faves. I'm sure we'll have more opportunities we'll, to We'll dish. have plenty more for the, the back <laughs> mm-hmm. half of this podcast. Uh, Which we'll transition into right now. <laughs> Perfect. Whoa, are we talking about answering some questions in this Q&A section? <laughs> <laughs> I've been here the whole time. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> we got a lot of questions from you guys about Zelda because it is something of a popular topic on this channel. And uh, we're going to be going through with our lovely guests and our lovely selves and answering as many of them as we can in this all Oops All Zelda special. Um, this first question, as always, does come from one of our lovely patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, support the channel, consider becoming a patron to have your question featured in a future episode. Uh, this one comes from Frost Knight to all in honor of Tears of the Kingdom. What element would each of you be the sage of? <laughs> so if you were one of the sages of however many there are in the game, what, uh, what element would you be the sage of? I- I should say, I didn't mention earlier, uh, we're, we're going to be talking about Tears of the Kingdom pretty thoroughly. We're not going to get to the very end of the game, but like, if you haven't played it and want to discover it for yourself, go discover it for yourself. Now is the time to tap out. Yeah. Yes. Um, we, we managed to avoid spoiling anything in the first half, but now, yeah. save yourself. Yeah. Go play Gloves the game right now. Thank you for all. Hmm. So are we restricting ourselves to the classical Zelda elements? I'm going to say it could be a classic element element, or if you want to pick a new one, go nuts. You know, what, whatever you feel in, you know, your heart of hearts, you would be the sage of. Can I dibsies lightning? I just think it would be cool. <laughs> Lightning's cool. <laughs> I was you. waiting for you to say it. I just assumed. <laughs> well, it was either that or fire. I'm a predictable person. <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, I'd like to be the sage of time. I don't Ooh. think I am, but that would be a cool one to be. I mean, I'm terrible at time management, so. It, <laughs> uh, but if I could, uh, if I could harness that skill, that'd be pretty cool. Um, yeah. I imagine that's a that's a common parental experience. If only I just had infinity time. <laughs> but I feel like having more. time powers on top of that would be so dangerous. It's like, oh shit, did I leave time frozen? Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> oh, did I, I leave the here? time on? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's good. I feel like my boy Rivali. I just need the gale to go up again, and if me <laughs> being the sage of air could like oh, create that updraft, I just want to go up. I need. <laughs> we got rocket shields for that. Yeah, no, we, we have go up at home. It's not unlimited. <laughs> it doesn't just happen. When whenever we're we're playing, my my wife Cyan and I, and like a rocket appears on screen, she like looks at me like, oh no, and then I start like collecting them all into one spot, just not even because I'm going anywhere in particular, just because I want to make a vehicle that'll shoot me up in the air at a million miles an hour, even if that's not what I was doing at that moment. It's like uppies, I want to go up. <laughs> all right, Master Koga, jeez. Yeah. Oh man. Um, uh... Yeah, Master Koga, the Sage of Bananas. Um, <laughs> I, I I know uh, um, the 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 window between ice and water is 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 either thicker or thinner depending on your your franchise. But um, Cryonis was so useless in Breath of the Wilds that even though we've established some some ice themes for the Cool Colors gang over here, I, I feel like I can't go for that. Sage um, water is useful though. They bundled it with like all the stuff: it's water attacks, healing powers. Yeah. You know. So with with the associations, I feel like water would be would be pretty cool. Uh, not that I'm much you don't of a, gotta box a swimmer, yourself in. but um, <laughs> I do. As much as I feel like I'd be stealing Raru's thunder by by being like light, I want light. Light that would be pretty thunder. cool. That's Get out uh, of here. <laughs> that'd be a fun one to have. I feel like there's a lot, a lot of opportunities for symbolic combat against the forces of darkness. Nice. Just nice. get the master sword what? to glow a whole bunch. <laughs> You're telling me Hero's Journey 1.0, The Legend of Zelda, has a light versus darkness theme? No. <laughs> no. Yeah. Um, a very we'll meandering just... answer. <laughs> Well, this next question comes from Arctic High Int Low Wiz. What is better, link hair down or link hair up? Link hair down, my man. Down. Come on. Down. I cosplayed uh, wearing the, or not literally cosplayed. I had Link always wear like the the headband. Uh, like you can mm-hmm. find a little uh, hairband in a place. Oh, the I guess we're kind holder, of yeah. yeah, his and ponytail or holder. holder. Yeah. And I, even though it's not useful at all, it doesn't give you any bonus, I wore it the whole game. So I'm yeah. hair up. It's, I'm hair up. I, I'll, I'll agree with you on the basis of if it was important enough for Zelda to keep one, mm-hmm. then clearly it's important enough to wear that style. 
Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I kept it. I just didn't wear it. I put it on yeah. once and I was like, cool. <laughs> no. Yeah. I don't even wear a hat in most of the game because they insist on ponytailing the hair. Yeah. I Sometimes like the half up, for half fashion. down look. Yeah, yeah you gotta, Ooh, yeah. you gotta, you can't fight crime if you ain't cute. You know, you gotta mm-hmm, rock mm-hmm. that half up, half down. It's practical, but it's also, you know, adorable. It's a win-win. <laughs> I've been um, wearing the uh, Divine Beast helmets because they let the nice. hair stay long in the back. <laughs> and uh, fun fact, if you do that, your, cor- your corresponding sage spirit will be wearing the jade version of the mask. Mm, yeah. uh, oh, there was really no warning deal. about it. It just says in the description, like, it's said to deepen your connection with the corresponding group. And I was like, whatever. But I keep wearing the um, Vaughn Meadow one. <laughs> well, I miss Rivali, so I keep wearing the Vaughn Meadow one. And Tulin's power is the only one I use on the regs. And I look over and I was like, he's wearing a hat. So <laughs> this yeah. game is so Everyone fun. There's so much stuff boy. in it. And now who do we miss? <laughs> Who do we miss so in this much game? Fucking game in this game. Oh, I miss all of them. I miss all of the sage power or the, the champion powers. Champions, yeah. I I use Sidon's power so rarely. I miss Mipha's grace. Yeah. Oh, I I turned them off for the majority of my playthrough. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would flip on to Lin every once in a while when gliding, mm-hmm. but yeah, I. I, li- I like just being alone. Mm. I like yeah. just I, yeah, running around alone. I, the thing is, I like having the squad around because they don't register in my brain as, like, other people. Because mm-hmm. uh, the thing is, the AI for them is not the smartest. And it's kind <laughs> of adorable. But on the chance that I, like... KO something I'm fighting. They will all just cluster around and curb stomp, and it's the funniest <laughs> fucking visual. It's like it's just that JoJo gif over and over again. It's like you're just trying to grab some moblin horns, and yeah. then Yunobo's like, "I'm gonna cause an explosion of a nuclear scale," and then Tulin's like, "All right, get these moblin parts out of here." <laughs> I just like it. I just like the get 'em boys of it. Yeah. This is sort of a related question from Starlight. Uh, what is your favorite new mechanic from Tears of the Kingdom? So. Mm. A kind of talking about this already. <laughs> it's 100% ascent. It's ruined all public spaces for me. I see like an underhanging balcony and I'm like, I could get up there. Like I was already thinking that, but now I'm not thinking about realistically how to do that. Yeah, that's interesting. I remember uh, when I first played Assassin's Creed 2, I started looking at every building like oh, that yeah. of like, oh, I, c- I could climb that. And <laughs> and so it's interesting to, and I couldn't, uh, but theoretically maybe. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's interesting to look at something and be like, I could have said that. <laughs> I, I could phase into the ceiling. <laughs> I've gotten, like, the thing is, when that trailer first dropped for Tears of the Kingdom and we saw the new mechanics, I was like, I'm never going to get the hang of this. This looks so yeah. complicated. Mm-hmm. And then the game was really good at teaching you how to use it. And yeah. I, there was a moment where the switch flipped and I got the hang of Ascend. And I was like, can I ascend? Then I will ascend. Yeah. I must ascend. Mm-hmm. Um, the, one, the one that did it for me was the, it's one of the early shrines, I, I don't know which one, where there's, like, a platform... Um, that's rotating on a hinge and what you do is like you move it to the side and then Put a fan underneath it So the fan pushes up and then you can ascend mm-hmm. through the other side to get up and I'm like, oh my mm-hmm. god I see through the <laughs> matrix. I get it now Because Gamers don't look up. This is a known fact So the fact that Nintendo actually was able to make gamers kind of look up is really impressive design <laughs> Yeah, it's neat that it started as like a dev tool too, and then it, yeah. it was just mm-hmm. so annoying to oh, get really? out of caves. So they're like, "Oh, just Aww. like all the players have this ability," and I then was, they integrated um, it incredibly well to the point where if no, if I had not read that fun fact on a random website on like a Tuesday morning, I would not have any idea that this was wow. not an intentional original part of the game. I like how the game sort of trains you to start thinking about how you can use these powers in increasingly weird ways, and the game is just so big and not built around the puzzles that these problems could easily solve that it doesn't break anything but like i was in a cave and the um the bubble frog was like in this tiny cave right at the top and it was too high for me to ascend to and there was like a rock on the ground and i was using a recall to like to, i was like using ultra hand to pick it up and then recall to make it float and then ascend to ascend up into the rock so i could mm-hmm. try to ascend through the cave and it didn't work so i just threw a bomb at the thing but like <laughs> the point is it let me do that yeah <laughs> so cool yeah yeah the crazy stuff you can get away with with recall is is so mm-hmm. fun. Mm-hmm. Everyone say thank you, Zelda. Yeah. 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 So I guess what I'm hearing is the favorite mechanic is just the way that all the new char- mechanics work and interact with each other. Yeah. yeah. I, I think I like Fuse the yeah. most mm. uh, just because there's some really cool, like, I remember attaching a minecart to my shield in the beginning yeah. and be like, we're doing Tony Hawk. Let's oh, go. Yeah. Uh, so, like, noticing that and some of the wild and weird combinations you can do. I also think. Uh, it addresses pretty well a lot of people's biggest complaint about Breath of the Wild, which I am I am a fervent defender of weapon the durability, durability. system yeah, was, in Breath of the Wild. Yeah. I love weapon durability. Uh, fight me. But <laughs> but I do think that it uh, pushed one bad behavior in Breath of the Wild, which is like 
I have a good sword. I'm going to avoid this yeah, fight. Yeah, hoarding weapons, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and not but, but in Tears of the Kingdom with the fuse, uh, the best way to get better weapons is kill strong bokoblins. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So so it kind of good. perfectly uh, marries those ideas and makes it so, yeah, weapon durability works better and, and you don't get nearly as frustrated uh, and, and don't avoid fights. So I, I like yeah. that a lot. Yeah. And also, because they didn't get rid of weapon durability... Uh, there's still an incentive to get the Master Sword because, you know, Mm -hmm. recharging after 10 minutes is better than losing it forever. But the Mm -hmm. other thing about the Master Sword, spoiler alert in the game, you can fuse things to it. It doesn't Mm -hmm. change how the sword looks. It adds this little glowy, like, aura effect. And then it increases the damage. It gives it elemental effects. Uh, You can get, like, healing artifacts from it. And the the fused material breaks off of it when the sword breaks and resets, so you can just keep fusing new stuff to it. And that's really cool because it always Mm -hmm. gives you this option. Um, I just, yeah, so, so yeah, the fuse mechanic and especially the weapon fuse mechanic, I mm-hmm. think is awesome. Um, yeah. yeah. Extremely cool. Well, this next question comes from your local space cryptid to all. If you were to live in Hyrule, where would you want to live? Uh, as far away the from kingdom the castle or as possible. Breath of the Wild version, because like um, Lurlin Village, super idyllic in Breath of the Wild, not so fun. Tears of the Kingdom. It doesn't <laughs> specify, so if you would like to tag on a caveat of in this time period specifically, be my guest. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, go nuts. The lack of specificity in questions works only mm. to your advantage. I'm not yeah. going to add rules. That's not mm. what I'm here to do. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they all kind of have severe problems, environmental and otherwise. <laughs> yeah. uh, I feel like aesthetically, I like the idea of living in either Gerudo Town or Rito Village, but also I hate hot weather. So I think maybe yeah. the desert's just mm-hmm. straight out. We would uh, get toasty fried so fast. <laughs> so fast. Yeah. Uh, which does put give Rito Village the edge. Uh, but in terms of like actual habitability and long-term uh, enjoyment of my living area, like Hateno Village or Kakariko Village are both pretty safe. Yeah. Put me on the great Sky Island, cowards. <laughs> I'll just build my house there. I. <laughs> it's got gliders. I'd be fine. Mm-hmm. If I lived in Hateno Village after CC and the new like fashion wave comes in, I'd be so curmudgeon-y. <laughs> like, all you people in your new age fashion, no respect for the traditions of Hyrule. You would be one of the NPCs I had to spend 30 minutes running around to give a mushroom to in that yeah. first part of that quest. <laughs> yeah. I, I really do like Terrytown in, in both games. Mm. It's just mm. so fun and so pleasant. And what it represents of like creating a new space for people in the game to feel like there's a home for them in this broken, awful world. Yeah. Um, I haven't spent a lot of time there in Tears of the Kingdom yet, but I see they're like expanding. And there's like there's a little bit of like, we're clearing out this forest for a new development. I'm like, oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've been to Florida. I know what that looks like. Um, <laughs> But I, I do really like the idea that it's kind of a space for everybody. Um, whereas they're they're like everybody has a space in Hyrule, but I like that Terrytown's like anyone can show up. We're we're mm-hmm. cool about that and, <laughs> and that's really fun. Yeah. I'm gonna buck the trend. Oh. Uh, we're going to Majora's Mask. <laughs> I'd want to live in Clock. I mean, not with the moon. <laughs> I uh, love to live in Clock Town any other time. <laughs> post moon, yeah. <laughs> like a week after uh, it's saved. I-, I think Clock Town is uh, just one of the coolest Zelda cities uh, in 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 the franchise. Uh, yeah, it's just a cool little place. Uh, I like it. Um, yeah. As far as Breath of the Wild, though, definitely Rito Village. If I could mm. fly. Uh, oh, yeah, but absolutely. if I can't cool. fly, <laughs> if you can't fly, Rito Village is Which kind I can't. of a pain. Yeah, that's really the uh, like. Really how many powers do I get? Yeah. You know, you get leg day every day. Yeah. <laughs> if I'm a Rito, steps. then or if we if we accept the uh, Age of Calamity timeline, the Castle Town pre Calamity seemed kind of neat. <laughs> oh, great place to set up mm-hmm. shop. Nothing mm-hmm. could possibly go wrong. Yeah, you know, until yeah. <laughs> no general, ancient like, evils. Zelda here. survival. You want to be as far from the castle as possible. <laughs> You know, I want um, somebody to make the the mod where you just put Guardian Stalkers back in Tears of the Kingdom because I miss them so much. Yeah. I got so used to slicing off all their arms and legs. It was so fun, and now they're just gone, and I'm mm-hmm. sad. Um, well, this next question comes from Zero Eleven. What is your favorite armor set in Tears of the Kingdom? Ooh, I like hair. the minor set. Really? Uh, the mole not people. the helmet. <laughs> the helmet's kind of silly looking. The helmet's kind of silly. It's just like when people were like, oh, that like blue backlist number that you get for that like one dragon thing. Oh, that's the like the, the sluttiest set. armor set in the game. And I was like, have you seen the minor set? It's just chains. 
Um, oh. I love the froggy armor. I speed ran that <laughs> newspaper quest. I'm like, give me the fucking froggy armor. <laughs> and then the hat was much sillier than I wanted it to be, but it's still a perennial fave. I love the one arm moment. Um, mm-hmm. I like being a little frog. <laughs> I also have to highlight that that top is like very... How to describe? It's slutty. It's, it's a slutty top. <laughs> it's saved by the one arm look. It makes it look more streetwear, you know. Does it have a one? I thought the one arm look was because one of Link's arms is weird. Uh, I thought it had. It kind of. It's got like it's the got, sort of like extreme racerback look. Uh, are you talking about the froggy or the frostbite? The froggy. The froggy has one arm that's like a full really? like sleeve huh. situation. Yeah, and one arm that is Link's weird arm that is nothing, but it is. It's it's like right. a asymmetrical thing going on. I do like fashionable asymmetry. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah. But the the top underneath it is still doing that. Oh, I like its little hat. That's cute. <laughs> I don't have it yet, but I like the glide suit. That looks oh, kind of yeah. fun. Yeah. Oh, yeah. it's pretty awesome. I love yeah. the set bonus on that where you just don't take mm-hmm. fall damage anymore if you're wearing the full thing and it's oh, upgraded. I'm killing enough Aracudas. I need those eyes. Um, uh, it's awesome. <laughs> I'm like, I'm just going to jump off everything. What's, there's no rules. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, oh, so is that if you get to like level two? Yeah, with each if you upgrade. Pieces? Interesting. As Brad is I did not familiar do that. with, uh, if you stop, upgrade armor stop, sets two stop. times, <laughs> you can get a full set bonus you need. <laughs> Uh, Great fairies uh, yeah, are mine... like, oh, set bonuses. Let me like smooch you more, Link. <laughs> Upgrade your stuff more. <laughs> mine is probably also the glide suit. I, I used it a lot. It was those glide mini games are a lot of fun too. Uh, of just like diving down through oh, those I little circles. Yeah. Uh, I, I wish there were more. Uh, I wish there was more so to those islands. I've climbed to the mm-hmm. top of them, and it's like I'm sure one of them has like hidden treasure chests somewhere, but there's just not a lot up there, and it's I, kind of a bummer because they're the biggest things in the sky. Right. They look mm-hmm. so ponderous. I, I subscribe to your theory that we'll get more sky islands in DLC. Oh please, please, it's all I want. <laughs> <laughs> oh um, boy. Yeah. All oh, right. But aesthetic well, this... wise, I do like a lot of the uh, those like dragon sets. Uh, they slap. The, the Dinrail set, especially, I really like. I none of them cr- quite work for me with the head pieces. I think cause they all get links links like bangs out of the way, and that mm. severely reduces the impact of the haircut. But other than that, they're so pretty. <laughs> yeah. And the uh, the the Zonai armor set. That one's also cool. Hmm. It's or um... Zonite, I think it it like makes your devices more efficient, and it's got a really good look. Anyway, nice. This next question comes from Iris of the Rainbow. While we all love Tears of the Kingdom, no game can be perfect. What is your biggest issue with the game, or what would you change or add to it? Guardian stalkers. <laughs> I'm just slicing <laughs> off all their legs. I can't help it. The noise is just so satisfying to me. Yeah, I do wish there was a little bit more from Breath of the Wild, because mm-hmm. I, I love mm-hmm. I love seeing all the characters. I love going to the new places and seeing how they've changed. I understand why the Sheik Towers and, and shrines shouldn't be there anymore, you know? Yeah. <laughs> right. uh, like, from a design standpoint. It'd be nice if there was maybe a little more, a little more of their, exi- you know, seeing that their existence was once there. Yeah. Uh, I think it would have been so fun in the depths. You just hear the, you know, <laughs> and then, like, a oh. red light shines on you. So, like, a few guardians. It just, I, I think cool. you're right. I think you're right that the guard, like, that would have just been such a nice little touch. Mm-hmm. Um, that, yeah, it yeah. would have scared me. Yeah, the, I'm the, right there with you. It's, shit out of me. The thing that bothered me the most playing through Tears of the Kingdom was, like, why is no one mentioning the giant, uh, thing, like, animal like robots beasts. that were yeah. here? Why are the, where are the, why does no one even say the word divine beast? And I get why they don't from, like, a game. Yeah. Uh, game design standpoint, but as someone who played the previous game, I'm like, this is a sequel! I should I just, in the distance, I just need one very yeah. distant shot of, like, the wing of Vomito poking out from, like, mm-hmm. a rock that I can't reach or something. Just anything to, like, connect these two games a yeah. little bit more. I think it would have been nice if the Divine Beasts were, like, decommissioned somewhere. Like, mm-hmm. th- they don't even need to put anything in there. Just have yeah. them somewhere. Like, I understand, it's pretty easy to come up with a reason why they're probably been taken apart, because it's like, hey, if, uh, if these things went evil and started wreaking havoc, we should probably make it so that that can't happen again. <laughs> um, but I, I just, I was confused. Um, when I was exploring the Elden Volcano region, uh, before the minimap loads in, you can still kind of see the edges of bodies of water, so I hadn't gotten the tower yet, but I was like, there's a lizard-shaped thing on the map! It's gotta be my boy! Oh, no. And then it's just those fucking little lizard <laughs> legs, and I felt so yeah. cheated. Ugh. Um, I do think that... Uh, it would be nice if there were more little one-off unique things in the game because a Mm -hmm. lot of the time you go through this whole thing where you stumble on this cool thing and it's just a part of an armor set that you already know about or it's a sage's will or a crystal 
thing if you're in the depths, one of yeah. those like, yeah. Uh, I just, the number of times where I ran into something and I was like, oh, this is this is such a cool, unique thing. And then I ran into it again like four more times. And I was like, it's mm-hmm. less cool mm-hmm. now. Uh, like I know this would be difficult to do and I'm not saying that they have to do this. Cause of course the point, is, like most of the unique things in the game are put in the dungeons uh, and the, the major quest lines. Um, I just think like, the, the most fun part of these games for me is the free exploration and the just running into something weird and fun that makes a lot of sense but isn't really mirrored anywhere else in the game. Um, I don't know. I, I like the game. I just wish there was more of it. That's basically it. Like, <laughs> mm-hmm. this is this is how I felt about Breath of the mm-hmm. Wild. I like the game. I wish there was more of it. And then Tears of the mm-hmm. Kingdom was like, here's a ton more. And I was like, great. Is there still more? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I For me, I... Raz, in your video, you mentioned that you felt like the dungeons could have stood to be a little longer. Mm-hmm. And I I was almost thinking, like, if it, if they were longer, would I, would I have enjoyed them more? And for me, I think I found myself just a little underwhelmed by them overall. The presentation was fantastic for them. Mm-hmm. And I think they would have been better if they were longer, but the style of dungeon that Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom provide is just so different from the earlier ones. Like the, you know, Link's Awakening is an unfair comparison because it has like such high point of the series dungeons, but they're very straightforward. Even though you can do the the different little things you have to get in any order, I found that I was never really challenged by the dungeons at all, and the game is very mm-hmm. challenging. So mm-hmm. it's it's not like I'm I'm some god gamer. I'm getting my ass kicked left and right, but it just it wasn't happening in the dungeons, where there was no sense of like the puzzle box nature of it, where you can move things around or you're trying to untangle a space. It's it's usually very open. It's like the the skyship in Rito kicks ass. It's so cool, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. it's like all right, you go through this door, you go through that door, you go on top of this thing, and that's that's kind of yeah. it. So I felt that I I would have definitely liked if they were longer, but it's just that style of dungeon felt so much like here is an open space and like five rooms. Yeah. There you go. Mm-hmm. So I felt myself a little underwhelmed by the dungeons. It and was it felt almost like a downgrade from the Divine Beasts, where you can move them around, where there's there's less way to interact with it than yeah. in, in Breath of the Wild. I wish they would have married those ideas to get, you know, uh, of just yeah. continue, like finally having unique dungeon themes, because I know that was a big thing with the Divine Beasts, mm-hmm. is they all looked the same, the bosses looked mostly, they played a bit differently, yeah. but they looked about the same. One of them small. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> 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 he moved fast. Uh, but yeah, uh, no, I, I, I like the design philosophy of Breath of the Wild in general. So I do like dungeons that don't have to be done in a linear way. I, I think though they need to like keep <laughs> moving. If people are like, oh, I want traditional Zelda dungeons. I don't really want that, yeah. but I do think they need to keep moving more to a middle point that they haven't hit yet. It's like they took a step towards that right direction, uh, but it was a relatively small one. <laughs> uh, I will say having like, proper Zelda boss fights at the end oh, I love makes oh, yeah. all the difference in the yeah. world. Yeah. Cause, cause you're right. Like the, uh, skyship temple is a little underwhelming, but then you're like diving through cold and it's like, I don't so, remember any yeah, of that. Exactly. <laughs> like, I really, it's, yeah. the, 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 the dungeons feel like they are, they're just another little extra bit of preamble to the boss fight, which they mm-hmm. all just kick so much ass. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I yeah. think in, in that regard, considering the, the, the dungeon as, one step with very fancy set dressing and presentation in the long process of like you arrive in the new area shit's fucked and then you get to the coolest boss fight like in the series mm-hmm. not really but like mm-hmm. like up there um, mm-hmm. yeah and no, uh, I, 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 also, I think you're spot on about that I really like not I mean obviously we're talking about things we want to fix but I also do really like that all of the boss fights are mirrored in the depths there are like yeah. multiple Kolgaras r- flying around because I I just like went through it like anywhere i saw any big arena on the map i was like let's go fight whatever that thing is mm-hmm. uh like let i saw someone auto build a thing that could take out the muck to rock i wonder if that'll work and just like having fun with it um because that means you can just fight the more bo- the bosses again whenever you want and get like right, yeah. parts and yeah. i just thought that was a lot of fun yeah that's um, awesome but yeah i also think more sky islands with yeah. more stuff mm-hmm. to do i think <laughs> another layer of sky islands that are higher up because here's the Ooh. thing here's the thing okay four layer high <laughs> well, like, four layer high that, <laughs> please please for the dlc that's all i'm asking just another <laughs> entire map <laughs> <laughs> but like in Overlookout Landing, there's one of those flower islands. You can see it on the map. Um, 
And uh, it's like the highest up thing there. It's way higher than the Temple of Time. It's higher than the tops of those uh, Valor Islands. And I like burned all of my cores getting all the way up there. And there's nothing there because that's the island that the Stila fell from in the first place. The mm. one that landed in Lookout Landing. There's nothing there. And I was so bummed. I put like a little, um, like a warp point up there just so I could get back there just because I was so mad. But yeah. but like the- That's a cool detail, <laughs> yeah. but yeah. it sucks for you. And, like, it, like there wasn't even a chance. But like the atmospheric oh, yeah. perspective, like you can't even see the island until you're pretty close. And I was like, there could be more stuff up here. They should put more stuff up here, please. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's my suggestion. What they should have done was at the very top of that flower island, they should have had one of those little Korok guys where it's like, Aww. I need to reach my friend. But the friend <laughs> is on the bottom on like the surface. So He's in, in order to solve the puzzle, you just drop him from orbit. <laughs> I would this love is, that. Uh, this leads right into another question we've got on the list here from Cassowary. Good. Do you believe the Koroks deserve what they are getting? Uh, <laughs> with This game obviously has invited players to, <laughs> it, in, intentionally or not, uh, get a little bit of vengeance on the Koroks for all 900 of their hiding places in Breath of the Wild. Do you think that this is an earned... <laughs> This Before we get to the subject of whether or not they deserve uh, what they have coming to them, there's a phenomenon that Brennan Lee Mulligan described in Dungeons & Dragons where if you ever are unfortunate enough to have allowed your players to basically be in a room with an adversary <laughs> character and they can do whatever they want to them, the amount of unspeakable horrors the players will inflict on that NPC is just truly horrifying <laughs> and in, in in one of the, the shows they they do get the the villain like basically tied up and just they do awful things to him so brennan's <laughs> like i make sure that i never let my players have that opportunity <laughs> ever yeah so the fact that they let that on the koroks like whether or not they deserve it th there was no situation where that didn't happen where they made a character a physics object <laughs> see the thing is when I first ran into one of those little guys on the Great Sky Island, he was like, I need to reach my friend. He's over there. And I looked over there and he was like, but I'm so weak. I can't move. I was like, oh, that's rough. And then I just moved on. <laughs> I like It didn't even occur to me that I could pick him up by the big old backpack until later. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, yeah, cool. So I have not been doing that because I find those puzzles kind of annoying. Uh, I like building vehicles for my own amusement, not uh, helping others i guess um, but, or hurting them yeah well but that's the thing they always go like oof whenever you move them around and i'm like yeah. oh i'm sorry i don't want to hurt you i guess i'll just leave you here until you you yeah. know get that you know get your act together um so yeah i, I haven't i haven't done anything unspeakable to any koroks yeah. although the fact that they give you the one on the great sky island very close to the ledge is like mm -hmm. they have to know someone's gonna fumble the bag and just straight right up away. drop him and then never forget that I mean, it's there's me, a, there's a video someone. from uh, YouTuber Small Ant who like drops him off the edge and says 899 to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, so one thing, I mean, first off, I think it's hilarious, all the videos that came out. It's one of those very organic, like, <laughs> moments with a video game. Just mm -hmm. because of all the flexibility that, that Tears of the Kingdom has, you can do that weird stuff. Uh, and everyone wants to share their goofy experience. What I will say is everyone's pretending like they collected 900 Korok seeds when like, no. when, when Gerard the completionist did yeah. and the rest of you, like you got like 50. We you, you, you are, have you know? a mutual friend who in Tears of the Kingdom has already collected 100%. all of the Korok seeds. 100%. It's Terrifying. Shout out to Noir from Roller with Difficulty for truly being the wildest man yeah, out here. He sent us a screen cap of his loading screen and it's like like 155 shrines, 90 light routes, this and this. All the batteries were like, bro, you good? You're doing a PhD. Are you good? <laughs> You're building stuff that goes into space. What are you doing? Yeah, Korox. <laughs> Oh my god. Uh, well, we have time for, I think, one last question here before we wrap up this very special Oops All Zelda edition of the podcast. Red, <laughs> once again, this, consider this your formal warning that in about five minutes or so, you may have to create an outro as, as such for this podcast. Is this, strap a yeah, Korok to the back of it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this comes from, oh boy, this name, uh, Zarevius. 
to all, <laughs> if you sure. were an NPC in Breath of the Wild or Tears of the Kingdom, what race would you be and what would your occupation be? So basically, insert yourself as an NPC into these games. Uh, I feel like we've gotten this variants of this question like eight times. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> what, what race would you be in Tears of the Kingdom? The people want to know. say Hylian. Um, hmm. Well, I wouldn't wear a backpack, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> you could be a Hylian if you want. The, the rule it just says pick one. Honestly, I respect how many adventurers and treasure hunters there are out there that yeah, are just constantly I getting into in scrapes. Game. The Zone it's I funny. research team. <laughs> I do love the Zone I research team. Uh, it's very fun to run into them, although... Uh, anytime I run into somebody, I'll put on the Yiga Clan outfit first, just to be sure, because usually they're a Yiga Clan member, and they'll be like, "Oh, you, you how you going, man? <laughs> just looking out for that that Link guy, am I right?" <laughs> um, that's always fun. Uh, I got the earthquake um, technique yeah, uh, in game, and it's so yeah. fun. Nice. Um, I keep using it accidentally, though. Uh, <laughs> I think. Yeah, so I, I think just like one of them random like adventurers and treasure hunters uh, would be so fun. Just you get to do all the fun shit, mm -hmm. and uh, sometimes you get to sword fight bad guys, and sometimes Link shows up, yeah, <laughs> silently so stares at you when you thank him. I similarly like I lo absolutely adore as much as I did speed run through it for the Froggy Armor. The like newspaper, the Clover Gazette like yes. side adventure is one of my all time favorite uh, side quests from the Zelda series uh and i do think it'd be fun to be like a wandering reporter npc yeah. like you just run into me <laughs> at miscellaneous stables and i'm like oh did you hear there's some nonsense happening on the, in this area we've heard the xyz rumor I, I i'm kind of miss running into tracy from the previous games uh because you mm -hmm. would just kind of periodically she would just be at places and she would tell you a little bit of like ha 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 i heard this rumor uh i love that kind of like blatant information dispensing npc so i think some sort of wandering yeah. reporter I, type okay. who's always just so a we little got bit off. How dumb Pen is in this game. I like whenever love you him. get into a scrap with like the Yiga, it's like and to think I almost wrote an article about Junior Reporter meets his untimely demise at the hands of the Yiga. Really? I love it's a shame bird. they mistook you for that swordsman guy. Oh my it's god. Like Pen, buddy. Pen. I love his I, uh, little birds. I love how he's always got his little sources but <laughs> out. It's truly okay, so like I like that we've got man. Adventure archaeologist and intrepid reporter. What other pulp archetypes can we come up with? <laughs> well, well, it's funny. I I was like, all right, I'd want to be a Rito because they're they can fly. Right. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Classic. And then like, what would be a cool occupation? I'm like, oh, like a bard. Uh, so I <laughs> cast. cast. I'd want to be yeah. cast. Yes. Is what I'm yeah. telling you. Where is my boy? <laughs> I know. DLC, put cast back. I have yeah, run right. That's into the big complaint. Pen <laughs> since break, finishing the uh, Clover Gazette side adventure. And when you run into him, he's like, oh, I'm hanging out here because, like, I heard there was a once a great bard who, like, studied in the spot. And I had to screenshot ah. that and send it to Noir and be like, look, they, like, they know they didn't put Cass in this <laughs> Where are you? Where are you hiding him? <laughs> oh, Numa. Tell me. <laughs> Give um, him back. I would he's love up to on be... the highest sky island just <laughs> fucking chilling. <laughs> you just hear, they'll be, imagine, though, like, you're, oh. you're going up and very faintly as you're starting to ascend, accordion. you hear yes, the beginning yes. of that sweet, sweet accordion music. Please. And then... <laughs> Come on. Add, add the, add, okay, so fourth layer of sky islands and Cass is at the top. <laughs> and he's just like, oh, we meet again, traveler. Say, have I told you how much you look like the hero lately? <laughs> Yeah, so we've got the of depth, storytelling. Hyrule, the Zonai Sky Islands, and then up top is Cass Rule, <laughs> his, his kingdom. Yeah. I also want Minish. I think it would be fun to put them in the game. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's fine. Um, uh, there's so I, many, I just want more game. I more essentially game just want to be that guy in Kakariko Village who just <laughs> loses his goddamn mind whenever Link comes with a picture of the, the ancient Stella where it's like, it's an authentic historical re uh, record of first-hand source. <laughs> Because what That's I did was a I, secret I took, blue cameo in this yeah. game. Yeah. <laughs> I, I took all the pictures and then like showed up and then like one after the other after the other. He's like <laughs> losing his mind. Oh my god, this is incredible! And I'm like, oh, you thought that was impressive? Check this shit out. Oh my god, a first-hand historical account. And just like, I, the guy needed to take a nap afterwards. I showed him so many documents in a row. <laughs> That's me. Oh boy. <clears throat> yeah, I think we would add to the rich and lively tapestry of Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom. Yeah. We all slot perfectly into spaces that are already taken up by other NPCs. This is great. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. We're no Ebony Darkest Dementia Raven weighing this one. We no, all integrate no, no. perfectly. 
we're all about that seamless story integration. There is going to be no <laughs> narrative dissonance here. I do oh, want no, I'm to inexplic- be a Goron, <laughs> Goron deep sea diver. Oh, That's my yeah. new one. There we go. Boom. I do inexplicably want to have the master cycle, though. I want to be doing my adventure archaeology stuff, and I just have Link's bike. You could be excavating the master cycle. Ooh. You're just like a guy in Hateno, and then after the upheaval, and it's like, the princess and the champion knight are gone, and you're like, just like scope out like their backyard. It's like, get on the bike, vroom, vroom, and just take off. And you get two miles down the road, and the bike runs out of juice, and it's like, I don't know how to work this thing. I can't put star fragments in here. No, I, I choose to believe that Link accidentally crashed it into a ditch one time and forgot about it, and I just found it like, whoa, the find of a lifetime. Yeah. <laughs> Like a horse, but better. (laughs) Um, Well, that about brings us to time for this podcast. Red, are you ready to once again take us out, as it were? (laughs) I was born ready. I don't Uh, know that you were. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, come on. I fought this battle so many times. It's like it's bound to my bloodline or something. Thank you all so (laughs) much for listening. As always, we'll be back in some number of days or weeks with a regular episode of the podcast, this being a bonus episode. Uh, Play Zelda while we're gone. Uh, (laughs) Yeah, uh, Tears of the Kingdom is fun, and other games as well. Um, (laughs) You're you're doing uh, great. (laughs) Great. We'll also be back on uh, Fridays with videos. Uh, Check out the channel of our illustrious guest, Rasputin. Uh, Always fun stuff. Uh, If there are any specific videos you want people to check out, do you want to... Uh, you watch watch that sound of loneliness one because yeah. Yeah. yeah people didn't so <laughs> <laughs> relatively speaking a lot of people yeah. Wanted, but yeah, yeah. No, we, oh. we know that feeling <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah I poured my heart and soul into this and I had such a good time making it and it's ten out of ten on the list <laughs> exactly <laughs> oh boy uh yeah I think we don't have anything to announce um no. other than that so I guess until next time I have been red I've been blue and Raz thank you so much for joining us. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Anytime. Thanks so much for listening to this very special Oops All Zelda bonus episode of the Overly Sarcastic Podcast. We will be resuming our regularly scheduled uploads on August 2nd, but if you miss us before then, be sure to check out Overly Sarcastic Productions on YouTube. Got a question for the pod? Head over to Ask OS Pod on Discord for a chance for your question to be featured in a future episode. If you enjoyed the show, please rate us and leave a review on your preferred podcast platform. And if you really enjoyed the show, consider becoming a patron. Links to all that and our guest Rasputin's content can be found in the show notes below.